shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. struggle we call on the name of Jesus, Jesus. only I can lean on Jesus, 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 there's no name above the name of Hallelujah. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's a good day to praise the Lord, isn't it? 
So we're going to sing about how mighty he is. An all-powerful God. He's all-powerful. He's almighty. So we want you to worship with us. Will you do that? We're going to decree and declare that he's mighty in all of his ways, right? He's a healer, isn't he? He's a deliverer, right? He's a way maker, right? So why don't we stand on our feet and get ready to go up? Yeah. Everybody go up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Lord, you're mighty. Lord, you're mighty. Lord, you're mighty. 
the Lord of all. He's the Lord of all. He can do anything but fail. What a mighty God we serve. Mighty, mighty, mighty. Mighty. Angels. Angels. They bow before the mighty God. I don't, I don't think you get it. So we'll do it again. What a mighty God. Regardless of what's going on in this world. Our God is still mighty. Our God is still victorious. There's no reason to panic because God has everything under control. Angels, they bow before the mighty God. One more time. Hallelujah. 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 If you believe that, give God a great big shout in this place. We have a new song for you. Uh, with all that's going on in Afghanistan and in Haiti, we need to remind people that we serve a mighty God. There's no one more mighty than God. So if we get in position where we need to be and we pray to our Father, things will change. It tells me demons flee at the name of Jesus, right? So why are we not calling his name if he's so mighty? If he has all power in his hand, then why are our mouth closed? Why are we not calling out to our Father? So I want you to lift your hands today. If you want to come up here, there's still room at the altar. But we want to worship God today with your whole heart, with everything you have. Oh. Oh, 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 yes. It's a mighty one, mighty one. We worship you, mighty one, mighty one. We worship you, oh, I've tasted and seen your goodness, and I've stood the power of your presence, for i felt the depths of your mercy, and how your love, it always surrounds me, to mighty one.
save and mighty to heal. We worship you. Said mighty
Come on. Your good and I've stood in the power of your presence. Oh, I felt the depths of your mercy. Oh, how your love it always surrounds me. Mighty one, mighty one, mighty one, mighty. God is mighty. No, no. Do you do you believe that though? Do you believe God is mighty even though there are terrorist attacks? Do you believe God is mighty even though there are earthquakes? Do you believe God is mighty even though there's earthquakes in your life? Do you believe that God is still mighty? Do you believe that God is still on the throne no matter what the crisis? Come on, lift your hands. Do you believe that God is mighty? Huh? Come on, come on. One more time. Come on, come on. Come on, lift your hands and worship. Come on. Come on, worship again. Come on. a hard week, Father, for some personally. It was a hard week, Father, for our country. It was a hard week for the world. But we know that you are still the mighty one. You are still in charge. You are still on the throne and you are not worried. So, Father, right now, we pray for our country in the name of the Lord Jesus. We pray for the blood of Jesus to cover America, God, and Americans, God. We pray for the blood of Jesus to cover our leaders, Lord God. We pray for a spirit of biblical wisdom in the name of Jesus, Lord God, as they navigate all the things that are going on. Father, we pray for Afghanistan, Lord God, especially the underground church there, God. We pray for every believer that is in Afghanistan that is under the threat of death, Lord God, but we know that their eternity is secure, Father. So I thank you, God. We don't pray prayers like this, but if they must die, let them die well. If they must die, let them die without fear. If they must die, come on, pray. You don't want to pray like that, but it's true. Let them die with the peace. Let them have the comfort of the precious Holy Spirit, God. We know what they are facing, but we know you can release angels. We know that you are in charge. We know that you are on the ground in Afghanistan in Jesus' name. Father, we pray for Haiti that's kind of been lost in the shuffle in all this, God. We pray for each one of those families, God, that lost loved ones, God, those that have been displaced, those that have no housing, those that have no food. We pray for the country of Haiti, God, that it will find the Lord Jesus Christ on a national level, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, that your peace is upon them, Lord God. Father, we pray for Australia, Lord God, the church that is there, Lord God, that you would cover them, Lord God, and that you would protect them and that you would keep them, God. And then finally, we pray for Uganda, Lord God, that is at a two-month extension of that house so the church cannot operate. But we thank you. They are doing ministry in the street, Lord God, because of the giving of Abundant Living Family Church high desert. They're still taking food. They're still transporting people. I thank you, Father, that the gospel cannot be shut down. But in these times, God, things are getting rough. But as they get tougher, the Lord Jesus' return is near. So we praise you and we honor you and we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give God a shout. Come on, come on, lift your voice. Come on. They need us to pray, amen? Hallelujah to Jesus. Praise God, praise God. Amen. Well, we want to welcome you to Abundant Living Family Church High Desert, where we have passion for God, passion for people. We thank you for being here today. How many of y'all are excited that you're alive? 
Come on, come on. You got to make sure you got to make sure you get your head. You got to make sure you get your head in the game. Can I tell you something? This was a rough week, wasn't it? Huh? It was a rough week. But listen to me. Because 27% of the Bible. How many of you guys know 27% of the Bible is predicting the future and future events? Now, 27% of the Bible is telling us what is to come. How many of you know you serve a great and mighty and awesome God that God will tell us in advance so we are prepared so we're not fearful this is not a time to be fearful this is a time to fight come on somebody talk to me this is not a time for you to shrink back this is not a time for you to give up this is a time for us to be on our knees praying for your families praying for America praying for the world but praying for the return of Jesus Christ we are not sitting here like we have no hope we have a hope and his name is Jesus and he is coming back he is going to be here, and he is going to come and get his church. In Afghanistan, watch this, Vincent. In Afghanistan, the underground church, before all this happened, because all you're going to see on the news is all the negative, and it is extremely negative. But how many of you know the underground church a month ago had 200 people in Afghanistan? Now it has over 2,000. So come on, we got to talk. So what, why on earth, Judy, would the church in Afghanistan grow when they're about to be slaughtered? God knows what he's doing. And the first church was born in persecution. This church is a church of comfort. The church today is a church of comfort. And the minute something happens, we shrink back, fall over, and pass out and have to take a Xanax. Now, no offense if you take a Xanax. But that's not what the church is supposed to be. That church is growing because they know their death. Here's what they said. We know our death is certain, but we need to let people know that their eternity can be even more certain. And Afghans are coming, Joanne, to the knowledge of Jesus Christ under the threat of death. So watch how you pray. American Christians are the only ones that pray this stuff will go away instead of praying for strength to go through. You and I need strength to go through, amen? All right, we're going to bring back something we used to do. Right, we got to get back on track. How many of you know COVID knocked everything off track? All right, so I want you to put your hand over your heart. Come on, put your hand over your heart. This is our abundant living creed. So we're going to say it together. A lot of you are new and don't know about it. So just like you pledge allegiance to the flag, we're going to pledge allegiance to the, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So I want you to memorize this, and this will bless your heart. Put your hand over your heart. On the count of three, one, two, three. We are abundant living, and we receive the life of Jesus. Our families, our friends, our communities will know about his life. We will experience abundant prayer. We will provide abundant care. We will pursue abundant health. We will increase through abundant wealth. We will love in our abundant families, and we will commit to abundant service. We are abundant living, and we will know him and make him known. Come on, give him a shout. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. So we're going to do that every Sunday. All those things matter, your prayer, your family, your service, amen, and caring for people. All right. How many of y'all enjoyed Minister Mike last week? All right. I'm setting a new rule. When somebody is preaching the paint off the wall while I'm on vacation, don't text me the whole time. I told Mike, I'm trying to be on vacation. People are like, Pastor He's amazing. That was off the chain. He's a beast. I was like, I'm trying to sleep because Minister Mike is preaching. Mike, I couldn't go on vacation because everybody wanted to tell me how good you was doing. Ooh, I appreciate that so much, man. I'm playing. You can text me. I'm so thankful that I can go on the break. Me and Pastor Kendra can go and relax, and we have ministers in the house that can keep it going, all right? Amen. Mr. Frank Tafoya, stand up. You next. Sit down. So get ready. Start praying. Get over it. Because the minute I say that to Frank, Frank's like, 
and Frank can preach the house down. Aren't you glad you got people here that can carry it? Amen. I'm so thankful. I love you, Mike. That's been my dog for a long time. All right, here we go. We're going to get into a powerful new series called what? What is it called? How many of y'all believe that? You know, if I ask a question, there's something else coming, right? How many of y'all really believe that? Okay, so here's the next question. If you got your hand up, how many of you guys are actually living what you believe? See, that's very different. That's very different. You can say, and the problem is, uh, Miss Jen, it's so good to see you. The problem is in church, when the pastor asks you a question, you want to give a spiritual answer real quick. But the question is more reflective than me trying to get an answer. I want you to think about, do you actually believe that your past is forgiven? And I'm telling you, Margie, we're going to go down the rabbit hole over these next coming weeks. It is so important because most of us don't know we're living in shame. Most of us don't know, some that we're appropriating guilt. And I'm going to run through the scriptures today, and I just want to reset you and let you know with beyond a shadow of a doubt, and we're going to end with something powerful today, that your past is forgiven. Everybody say, my past. Say it again. My past. Say it again. My past is completely, is completely forgiven. So why am I going back and getting it? Why am I going back and getting it? I was in my prayer chair. Y'all know I get stuff out of my prayer chair. And uh, the Lord said this to me, and I had to stand up and say, wait, what? Because I've never, ever, ever thought about this concept. In the book of Luke, chapter 4, I mean, chapter 23, here's what it says. It says, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And then it says, and they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Watch this, Pastor Kendra. This is crazy. So I'm sitting there. I'm in my prayer time, Tony, doing my thing. And here's what Jesus told me. And it shook me and birthed this series. Ready, Kelly? He said, I hung there and forgave all the Roman soldiers. But almost all of them went to hell. I thought that was going to be more powerful. Ready for this, Paul? This is heavy. He said, I forgave all all of the Roman soldiers. Watch, Brooke. But they went to hell. And it turned me completely around about forgiveness. I've read this scripture. How many of y'all have read this scripture before? We, we read it all the time. Watch this. They. They is the key. Jesus said, so look at them. But you got to remember, they're the ones that had the hammer. They're the ones that pierced his hands. Right here. Not here. Here. This was considered the hand in Hebrew, and it would have ripped right through here if it was a nail. They put it here where the tendons are. So all the blood, so this causes extreme pain to rise up the arm because all your nerves are coming together from the hand right here. And Ginger, they drove a spike, not a nail, they drove a spike through here and then through the other one. Unmercifully, Sean, they just pounded it through, then put one foot on top of the other and went through the gristle, went through the muscle, went through the tendons, one on top of the other, so that when he had to push up, he would push up, watch this, Janae, against the spike and how people died on the crosses, they suffocated. So the weight of hanging there, their diaphragm would collapse and get tired and then they would just suffocate. So they would have to push up, Miss Peggy, on the spike so they could get a breath. So they were suffocating over time. And the Roman soldiers are the ones, Wes, that put the spikes in his feet and put the spikes 
in his hand. And then he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Here's the revelation. When they come back and says, and they divided up his clothes, Mike, you ready? The they is referring to the they that was forgiven. Frank, we are forgiven too. But this passage says something different than I've always thought, Pastor Roy, watch. Father, forgive them. Who is them? The soldiers and us too. But, but in this passage, who is the them? And I've never looked at it like this, Sonia. Forgive them. The guy with the hammer. The guy with the spikes. The guy that beat me on the way up. The guy that put the 39 stripes with the cat of nine tails, they're all around, they're laughing. They don't care about Jesus because they're getting ready to gamble over his robe because his robe was seamless, Johnny, and a seamless robe was very expensive. You couldn't see the seams in his robe. So people that walk around think Jesus was poor, he was not poor. Come on, he got some money out of a fish. I think I need to go fishing after this. At Hesperia Lakes, huh? George, I'm going to stand there, bring forth of gold. Okay. For they do not know what they are doing. Who's they? They don't know what they're doing, Jesus is saying, by executing me. They don't know. This is a bigger plan going on, but they don't know what they are doing. They're under command. They're under the power of Lucifer, the evil one. They have no idea what they are causing, but it's all in my father's plan, and my dad is not going to prevent the pain. I want him to, but he's not going to, Richard. He's not going to pre prevent the pain. So, Father, if you're not going to stop this execution, then forgive the executioners. What? Who talks like that? For they don't know what they're doing, and they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Now, are you ready? And this is going to change the answer from earlier, and we're going to take our time and slow down. If Jesus forgave all the Roman soldiers and forgiveness leads into salvation, why did they go to hell? Boom! Shakalaka. Now this is a powerful moment. They were forgiven, Ron, but they did not receive it. If you do not receive it, you don't get the application, George, from what just happened. I can deposit money in your account. I can text you that I just zailed you, cash apped you, Venmoed you. If you don't receive it by getting it out, it's no use to you. And you can't blame me for not receiving it. Y'all, I'm going somewhere. Because I gave it to you. You didn't go through the emotional and physical effort to go get what I gave you. Everyone was forgiven, Mom. Every one of those Roman soldiers should have went to heaven. There was a movie my mom showed me when I was little. Remember the robe? The robe fell on a Roman soldier. Now, this is all fiction, but the robe fell on the Roman soldier, and when it fell on him, the robe just almost started strangling him. And he was screaming and screaming and crying out, Brooke. And he realized that he had just killed Jesus who was God. And the whole rest of the movie is about this Roman soldier going through his conversion, and at the end, he gets martyred. But he knows he's going to heaven. But that's just a movie. You and I have to make sure we're not living like a Roman soldier.
And we're going to get into all the emotions that go along with anti-forgiveness. Shame and guilt. Picking things back up. So today's message is the seed of forgetfulness. And I want to lay a foundation that your past has been forgiven. And I'm going to end with a powerful, powerful example. A lot of Christians, this is huge. You ready? Nate, a lot of Christians totally believe in the fact that they're going to heaven. How many of you guys are Christians? Raise your hand. How many of you? Y'all don't want to raise your hand no more now. You're like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. How many of y'all are Christians? Raise your hand high. Okay. All right. How many of y'all don't know? Be honest. Don't nobody want to say it. Thank you. Thank you, Big Sexy. I'm sorry. That's what they call them. Stand up, Big Sexy. That's what we call them. Big Sexy. <laughs> What's your legal name? Richard? Her title? Richard? What's your last name? Mendoza? Richard Mendoza? Big Sexy. So a lot of us are Christians. Raise your hand. How many of y'all are in heaven? <laughs> You have to come here and be ready to think. You can't be here sleepy after partying all Saturday. How many of y'all are going to heaven? The same number of hands should go up as the same number of hands that said they're Christian. But they didn't. See, come on, we're going to talk today. So I know I dig up stuff that you don't like, but it's okay. So let's say 100 of you raised your hand and said, I'm a Christian. Well, what does a Christian mean? That means you've accepted the forgiveness of Jesus and you're going to heaven. You have salvation, right? So 100 hands went up. I said, Who, how many are Christians? Boom. And then I said, how many are going to heaven? And like 75 hands went up. So I'm talking to the 25. You don't know if you're going to heaven, but you know you are a Christian. Here is why the 25 were hesitant or didn't raise their hand immediately. You're struggling with the process that made you a Christian. This ain't going good. You said I'm a Christian. But being a Christian means you are going to heaven. But saying you're a Christian and understanding how you got there is two different things. And if you don't know what you believe, the Women's Fellowship yesterday was off the Richter scale. It was so powerful. It was so powerful. I am so proud. Pastor Kendra gave a word. Uh, Miss Kelly gave us prepping Miss Pam on self-care. But I'm telling you, I am definitely ordering me a weave, and I will be there as a participant next time. Okay? Pastor Kidder said yesterday, if you don't know, if you can't defend what you believe, then you don't believe it. That was fire. If you don't know, if you cannot defend what you believe, then you really don't believe it. And I know I'm messing with you a little bit this morning, but we got to deal with this. There's a difference between who said they were a Christian, who said they were going to heaven, because most Christians cannot defend the process of becoming a Christian. And because we don't know how something happened, because we can't defend what something happened, because we're going by what somebody else told us, namely a pastor somewhere, or a little feeling, a little hair standing up, because we have this feeling about it, we have not thought critically about it so then when we are challenged like my question we are unsure if you are unsure if you're going to heaven I don't know if you could live in Afghanistan right now they have to be a hundred percent sure because when they get a knock on the door it's not Amazon when you get a knock on the door it's Amazon bringing the tenth package for today Kendra I mean people it's Amazon. But when they knock on the door in Afghanistan, they might be coming to pull you out. 
because they pulled up your biometrics and they know you were assisting uh, the uh, American government. They were killing people, uh, Doug, that had Bible apps on their phone. They were, how many of y'all knew that? They're grabbing people, looking at their phone, and if they have a Bible app, they're cutting their heads off. They're burning them alive. They burned up a woman for cooking badly. She was cooking badly, and they burned her up in the middle of the street. And here we are in this church, in his area, hot but comfortable. Am I the only one hot? And we are struggling to answer a question that has no consequence to the answer. We're in America, George, and we're struggling to answer a simple question, and it's okay. I'm not talking about you or me. I'm saying that the process is unclear, and because the process is unclear, we cannot live in the execution of the process. So listen again. How I get to heaven is two steps. It is forgiveness, and then it's salvation. Salvation does not precede forgiveness. Forgiveness means to release a person from a debt. It also means not to, watch this, Chewy, it means not to act on revenge or anger towards someone else. When, Matt, when I'm forgiving somebody, I'm not going to have vengeance on that somebody, and I'm not going to have anger toward that somebody. Ron, I'm letting it go. I'm, forgiveness means to let it go. Do y'all understand? So can I tell you this? Because this might seem basic, and I know today's basic by looking at your face, but it's okay. You and I made God angry the first time we sinned. Does this make sense, Tiffany? Good to see you. We made him angry. We made God mad. Do y'all know that God is angry at sin? And he's angry at the person. But God loves us. How many of y'all love your kids? How many of y'all get angry? So don't act like they're mutually exclusive. <laughs> God is, are y'all right today? Y'all seem sleepy. All right. So you can be angry, right, but still love somebody. So when you and I sin over and over again, God is angry. God is not happy. Jesus said, man, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Did I hang there for nothing? That was the whole series, Killing Jesus Again. Did I hang in there for nothing? Did I hang there for nothing? So when you sin and I sin, he's angry. But he will forgive us, and I'm going to read the scriptures today. He will forgive you. So what God does is he takes your sin, he puts it far away from you, and we're going to talk about today. He throws it in the sea of forgetfulness. Some of y'all don't even know that that's a concept, but we're going to talk about it today. He'll take your sin. Now, please listen. What he's doing, you ready, Miss Ginger? And most Christians do not understand this. He is separating your sin from you by removing the consequence of our sin in the equation of our salvation. I know. <laughs> Miss Garrett says, say it again, brother. <laughs> okay. He's not saying sinning is okay. He's saying if you ask me and are genuine, genuine, not just scared I'm going to get you, if you ask me, I will forgive you. I will separate sin from the equation of your salvation. <sighs> salvation comes to the sinner. So how does it come? By the sinner genuinely repenting. Young people, that means turn and face another direction and make a completely different decision. Repent. By genuinely saying, what I am doing is offending God. Joseph was in a house. He was second in command in Potiphar's house. 
But Joseph was fine. He had a 12-pack. His, his, his 12-pack Paul started here and went down to his knees. Like, he was ripped, right? I'm making that up. Joseph was ripped. And Potiphar had a wife. And Potiphar trusted Joseph. And Potiphar's wife was, like, looking at him like, he fine. And all the little helpers was like, I know he is fine, right? And, and they said, but you married. And she's like, hmm, he ain't here. So she started chasing him around, and she started going, lie with me, lie with me. Now, you know if Potiphar is in charge of most of Egypt, y'all know his wife is fine. She bad. She 36, 24, 88, but she bad. So, so some of y'all don't laugh. 88's not a problem. And the men said, amen. Amen, okay. So anyways, so she's fine. And she starts chasing him around. Now, most of us men, if she was chasing us, we would have went like this. Let me show you what most of men would. Not me, because I'm married to Kendra. So uh, most of us men would have been like this. She'd have been chasing us. Lie with me, lie with me. We'd have been like, oh. <laughs> I'm just off track today. When I was growing up, when I was growing up on, on my street, Richmond Street, right, we had a whole bunch of girls on my street, and we would just have fun at nighttime. So Meemaw didn't know what was going on because she was in the house. So when the street lights would go off, we, this is so old school. I'm going to say an old school thing, and some of y'all ain't going to understand it because I don't think if California y'all used to do this. But we used to play catch them, kiss them. Anybody know what catch them, kiss them is? Huh? Right, right. It's another version of, it's a hood version of hide and go seek. So now all the white people are going, oh, okay. <laughs> it's a hood version. So, so hide and go seek, you play in the suburbs because you don't get shot, so you don't care. But in the hood, you can't play regular hide and go seek, right? So we play hide and go seek, but catch them, kiss them is when you got caught, you had to kiss the person who caught you. So if somebody was ugly, you were so fast. You were so fast. You're like, I'm out. You ain't catching me, Bertha. No, I'm playing. I'm playing. So I remember I would just hide like, so like, so like the girl is like right here by the microphone and she's like, 1,001, 1,002. And it'd be like a stump here. And I was like this. Especially when Kathy was, uh, Kathy Jackson. Oh, Jesus. But Kathy, Kathy would be counting and I would be like, I hope I don't get caught. <laughs> Joseph had to run. And she was chasing him. Most men would have got caught. But you know what Joseph said, Kendra? You know what he said? He looked at her as fine as she is. And he said this, and we don't get this. How can I sin against God and my master? He said, how can I sin against my heavenly father and the man who put me in charge? Can I tell you, one of the reasons why we all get caught up in this whole issue of forgiveness and shame and guilt is because we're so worried about Potiphar, we forget we sinning against God. And that's why we fall and get caught by the sin that's chasing us. God is a forgiver. But you and I have to be genuine about asking. Genuine. All right. Enough about catch them, kiss them. Now, please, young people, don't go home and play catch them, kiss them. Okay? So John 3.16, everybody knows, don't they? Say it real quick. For God so loved the world. God is good. There is have everlasting life. Miss Peggy, this ain't Austin 316, Stone Cold. John 316, we all know it. But it's so popular, Kendra, it overshadowed verse 17. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. But to save the world through him. 
God sent Jesus not to condemn us, not to put his thumb on us, but he sent Jesus into the world, Maurice, so you and I could turn around when we fall and be forgiven because, Josh, we genuinely mean it. Christianity has been positioned as God. Come on, y'all. And it's messed our head up. Latanya, it's messed our head up. Oh, God's going to get you. Oh, oh, God's going to throw a, a lightning bolt. If you don't believe me, go call your insurance company and ask them this question. Glennis, ask them a question. Say, State Farm. And, and they say, hello. And then the guy that looked like Drake is on there. He's like, hello. Say, Glennis, say, say, hey, how come you call tornadoes and earthquakes acts of God? Why? Why you put that on God? I want you to call all your insurance people and say, excuse me, we would like to petition, Twyla, we would like to petition that you start calling earthquakes acts of the devil. See what they say. See what they say. They're not going to change it because they want you to think when a natural disaster happens. Are y'all preaching better than you responded? They want you to think that it's an act of God. Now, sometimes God will allow it, but do you understand what I'm trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you that we don't understand John 3, 17. God the Father sent Jesus in the world not to condemn us, but to save us. Not to condemn us, but to save us. So the question is, how many of us are living under condemnation? How many of us are living and being condemned? And so some of you are going to get fancy with me and say, oh, Pastor Mark, that's not me. I know I'm forgiven. I used to be this, and I used to be that, but I know. God has forgiven me, then ask yourself this. How come when something bad happens or you're going through a bad season, you think God is punishing you? Wait a minute, what'd you say? What did I say, Frank? Watch, watch. Christians walk around, I'm forgiven, I'm forgiven. I'm. And, and that's cool till you get hit. Then when a problem comes, you start going, how could God allow this? How could God let this happen? How could God let this happen to me? Watch, man. So then the devil says, it's because you were a stripper. Yum. It's because you were a drug dealer. It's because you were a devil worshiper. It's because you were atheist. Are y'all? The devil brings up your past because he wants you to go in here. Look at this. He wants you to go in here, and he wants you to find your past. But God threw it in the sea of forgetfulness. First John, let me pick up the pace. First John 1, 9. But if we confess our sins to him, Mike, we have to confess it. God is just not going to forgive you randomly. You and I have to confess it. That means you're acknowledging you know what you did that was against God's standard, Laura. And confessing means, God, you said this in the Bible. I did this. What I'm doing, Miss Rosa, is against what you said. So I need you to forgive me of this because in the Bible, you said I shouldn't do it. Are y'all... I know it's basic today, but sometimes we got to go back to the elementary things. Hebrews chapter 4. We got to go back to the, I mean, chapter 6. We got to go back to the elementary principles. Because some of us don't understand it. That's why we can't defend it. That's why we can't live it. So the devil whispers to you. It's because you did this. It's because you're doing that. It's because you didn't read. It's because you didn't work. It's because you didn't serve. It's because you got mad. It's because, it's because, it's because, it's because, wiki, 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 because. But first John says, if I confess my sins to Jesus, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And he forgives me and he cleanses me from all wickedness. But Wes, I get forgiven and I get a bath. Hey, sin makes you dirty. Not only am I forgiven. Can I tell you this? We're going to get into this later, kids. It's a legal term. It means to be pardoned. Ah. Next week's called pardon me. <laughs> Wait till you hear that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a legal term. So forgiveness is a legal term, right? But then there is a moral piece where I have to be cleansed. And when I'm being cleansed, that is I'm being cleansed of the reminder of what I did. 
So your past has been thrown away. I'm going to show you right now. But you can be reminded by the devil if you don't watch it, and you'll go back and pick it up in dark times. You'll pick it up in times of suffering. You'll pick it up in times of pain. But when you come to church, you're all clean. And you come, you got it, took a shower, hopefully, and you came to Abundant Living, and you're sitting here, and you're all clean. But what happens when the lights go off? What happens when you don't get the job? What happens when you get terminated? What happens? What happens when your spouse tell you they don't love you no more? What happens when your kid yells, I hate you? What happens when your kid don't come home at night? What happens when your girlfriend don't come home? What happens when your boyfriend don't come home? What happens when your finances are going down the toilet? The devil says, see, it's because, and what he's trying to get you to do is be like Job's wife and get you to curse God and die and blame God who is actually the solution. He is not the problem. The devil is busy. The devil's busy. Ronald, the devil's busy. He wants you to go back, and he wants you to pick up in the sea. Well, Pastor Mark, where do you get the sea of forgiveness? I want the scripture. Well, the term is not in there. The concept is, and it's in the book of Micah, chapter 7, verse 19. We're going to get more into Micah, chapter 7, verse 18 and 19 next week. With pardon me, but for today, it's just one scripture. Micah 7, 19, he's a minor prophet in the Old Testament like Nahum, Habakkuk. He's in that group. Now watch. He will again have have compassion on us and will subdue, watch Kendra, subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins in the depths of the, you will cast all our sins in the, he doesn't say he's going to take your sin and it's going to be like a piece of trash and float on the top. Because, Mike, trash on the top can still be seen. The scripture says that God again, it says again, he will throw your sins and my sins so far deep that it will take a submarine to try to find it. Come on, somebody talk to me. You ought to be excited today. You ought to be cleansed today. You ought to know that God... God is working on your behalf today. God is not trying to slam you. God is trying to save us. And he wants us to walk in that salvation and not carry shame, not carry guilt. You are not who you used to be. You are not because God took who you used to be, what you used to do, what happened, and he picked it up and he threw it into his own personal sea of forgetfulness. If that makes sense, shout to God with the voice of triumph. I'm trying to encourage you today. So much bad news, but what is the good news? The good news of the gospel of Jesus, that God died so you can live, that God died so you and I could be clean, that God died so you could have a brand new life, a brand new opportunity. Because Hebrews 8.12 says, For I will forgive their wickedness, say wickedness, and I will remember their sins no more. Okay, now I'm finna preach this. Isaiah, what have I been doing? Isaiah 43.25, I, yes, I alone will blot out your sins. Y'all don't, can't watch this, for my own sake. For my own, Dana, for my own sake, and will never. Oh, I'm, I'm, I can't preach this. And will never think of them again. Okay, 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 Miss Peggy. Wait, 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 God. Wait, 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 wait. You, first of all, Sharon, you, you, you're gonna, God, you're gonna pick up my sins. Yes, if you ask me genuinely. And then you're going to cast them into the sea, into the depths of the sea. Brooke, the depths, not the floaty, the depths of the sea. So you're going to take what I did, what Mark was doing, playing catch him, kiss him. You're going to take that. And why is that on my mind today? Hey, when we get home, I want you to chase me. So, 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 so he's going to throw it into the sea of forgetfulness, Frank, and it's going to go down to the depth. It's going to go down and it's going to shrink. And then it's called the sea, so you look at that. But then he adds a forgetfulness. So he adds that with Hebrews and Isaiah, Tony. He says, now, after I throw it into the sea, no scuba diver, 
No rescue team. I know they found the Titanic, but they're not going to find your past. They're not going to find your past lifestyle. They're not going to find what happened to you, Summer. They're not going to find your pain. They're not going to find your hurt. They're not going to find what you used to do. They're not going to find how people define you. I throw it in there, it's gone. Now, the second half is this. Once I throw it in there, Mom, the only person who can bring it up is you. The devil doesn't have the power to go get it. He's just reminding you it was thrown in there. So if the devil can't go get it, and he's just reminding you, the only person that can go get it, because I don't even remember that I put it in there. Do y'all understand this concept? No, no, you don't, because you and I can't forget stuff. Some of y'all are like, oh, I forget stuff all the time. I just forgot what you said. (laughs) But see, but then you can have recall. Prevagen, they got all these commercials, Prevagen, jellyfish. You know, you take a jellyfish pill and you can recall it. God says, I am self-limiting, Kendra, and I have designed in myself that when I forgive you humans, I will remember your sin no more. So when you say, God, is this happening to me? Watch your name, and we put the because on it. Because God says, I don't even know what you're referring to. And then he looks at the angels and says, what is Mark talking about? The angels go, oh, you you have to hear me. God makes it so it never happened. Y'all don't get it. This is the power of Jesus and why Christianity is right and other religions are wrong. Can you say that, Pastor Mark? This is on social media. Let me say it again. Why Christianity is right and other religions are wrong. Now, if you think I'm lying, study other religions. They bring it back up. Oh, I'm teaching better than you, amen. Am I lying? Other religions weigh it at the end. Weigh what? Y'all don't want this today. Weigh what? Wait, what? What are you putting on the scale, Mike? What, what is the other religion talking about? Oh, at the end, Kelly, we're going to weigh your good and your bad deeds. And if the good deeds outweigh the bad deeds, Matt, then you go to heaven. If the bad deeds outweigh the good deeds, then you go to hell. Stop, stop, stop. I don't want to be in a religion where I got to work for it. Oh, y'all don't want this. I don't want to be because I know how I am. And I'm going to work good one day and work not so good the next day. I don't want a religion that remembers what I used to do. I relationship that can take it and throw it away like it never even happened. That's the Bible. That's the Bible. That's why I serve Jesus. That's why I'm a believer. That's why I'm a Christian because I don't want it brought up again. And because of the cross of Jesus. So watch. Forgiveness has never been the problem. Receiving it has. Are y'all Roman soldiers, Miss Peggy? Forget. I hope y'all got something out of today. Forgiveness has never been the problem. Receiving it has. So here's my question to end today. What you think is my question? What's my question? Robin, my sins have been thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. My past life has been thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. Why am I renting scuba diving equipment? 
Why when I get hit? And why when things go wrong, Dana? Why do I put on my scuba diving equipment, Mike, and try to find the reason it's happening? Why do I want to find the reason I'm going through this? Why do I want to try? Why do I want to go in the sea door? How big is the sea? And why do I want to remind God of something he has no record of? What am I doing? What, what am I doing? Listen, it's so important if you're joining us by Facebook that you share messages like this so that it encourages your friends and your family. It's so, so important if you do this. People on Facebook, take this message and share it with your family and friends. Amen? Amen. Now, come on, give Jesus a shout, y'all. I would like to take our final moments together and talk to you today about eternity. How many of you have ever had somebody come and visit your house or a friend call and say, I'll be over, or family coming from out of town? You want to make sure that your house is presentable. You want to make sure that your house looks the best that it can be. Well, Jesus is the same exact way. Heaven is holy. And one of the things we forget about eternity is that we're going to live forever in his house. And Jesus wants his house to be holy, and he wants his house to be pure. So the problem that would stop us from living there is sin. That's why the Bible tells us that all have fallen short from the glory of God, and we all need to be saved. And so I want to give you this example. I don't mean to offend you, but it is the best example that I can give you. I always hear from people all the time, how come sin would keep somebody out of heaven? What if I only committed just one sin, Pastor Mark? Is that enough after 70 years to keep me out of heaven? So I want to give you this analogy. We did this in our church one time at a Bible study. We took a, a cup of ice cold water and we handed out the ice cold water to people and that water looked good, that water was refreshing and that water was pure. So the people drank the water and everybody was excited. And then we took one drop, one drop of dog poop. You say, dog poop? Yes, one drop of dog poop. And we put that poop in the water and we stirred it up. And it was amazing. When I offered everyone else a drink of water, no one wanted to drink it because they wanted their water to be pure. In other words, they wanted their water to be holy. Listen, the Lord needs holiness in heaven, and he will not compromise that. And the only way you and I can go to heaven and live with a holy God, live with a pure God, is that we are pure and holy. Now, we know that that's a problem because every day all of us fall short of God's glory and we sin. Enter Jesus Christ. So John 3, 16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever would believe in him wouldn't perish, but they would have everlasting life. So Jesus comes because he knows we can't do it, and he pardons us from all of our sin. When you accept Jesus Christ today, or if somebody has shared this with you, and you feel the Spirit of God and the presence of God, and you feel the conviction that maybe you need to turn your life around, you can only do that through the Lord Jesus Christ. Once Jesus forgives you, all your sins are removed, and then you can live in this holy and pure place. Let's pray together today. I want you to repeat after me wherever you are right now watching this live stream. Dear Jesus, today I understand that I need to be forgiven. Lord Jesus, our Father sent you here to die in my place. Today, I accept that reality so I can live with you for all eternity. Lord Jesus, please forgive all my sins today. If you said that prayer and you meant that prayer, then your sins are forgiven. They are thrown into the sea of forgetfulness. And guess what? You are what they call born again, but this time in God's family. We want to thank you so much for giving your life to the Lord Jesus today. It is an amazing decision that you have made. Now, I want to talk to you very briefly about your giving today. We have our scripture today, 2 Corinthians 9, 11, and here's what it says. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. That's 2 Corinthians 9 and 11. So let me just boil it down very quickly. Never forget that whatever you have, 
Whatever you possess, God has given that to you so you can sustain yourself and your family, but also so you can be a blessing when on every occasion. The Bible says, give to all that ask. And you have been provided for by the living God so that you have sustenance and substance so you can take care of your daily um, things that you need to do, but you can also be generous to those who are also in need and might not be in the situation that you are in. So I want to tell you today that when you give, you are obeying the scripture in 2 Corinthians 9 11, and you are enriched so you can be a blessing on every occasion. We are so excited that you joined us today, and I want you to know and always remember, we are Abundant Nation. God bless.